Uh, thank you very much, Louise, for that introduction, and good afternoon to um, everybody. Um, the, today's uh, topic of conversation or presentation is the economics of uh, machine translation, and I guess that really talks to the question, why would you use machine translation? What's the use case or what's the economic argument uh, for using uh, machine translation? So today we're going to um, cover, I'm going to give you a very short uh, presentation, one or two slides maximum on who we are, CantanMT.com, what we stand for, and the progress we've made with, um, and the success we've had with some of our clients um, worldwide. And then we're going to, I'm going to present the economic argument for using machine translation from a vendor's viewpoint, from a technology supplier's viewpoint. And then we have Alan, um, who will um, give a, his own view of the economic argument for using uh, machine translation um, as well. Now, we won't keep you at longer than 50 minutes, so we've uh, quite a, a, a large number amount of content to cover between now and then, but I do hope um, you find it helpful and useful um, for your business uh, today. So very, very quickly, who is CantanMT.com? Well, we're a statistical machine translation platform. We're 100% cloud-based, which means we're in highly scalable, very inexpensive to operate, um, and we deliver high-speed and high-quality translations for our clients worldwide. Um, the actual CantanMT.com platform is absolutely vast at the moment. In fact, we have an array of over 480 servers running the platform today for our clients worldwide, and we have approximately 7,500 engines. And um, our, the number of training words that our clients have uploaded to our site over the last 12 months um, is in excess of 100 billion words. And as of Tuesday last week, or Tuesday fortnight ago, we um, hit our one billionth word translated. So um, we've, we've got a vast array of servers providing this uh, machine translation, statistical machine translation services to our clients, and we're translating huge, huge um, volumes um, for those particular clients. Now, the Cantan platform only does three things, but we do those three things um, very well, or at least our clients tell us we do these three things very well, and that is we help our clients customize their own engines, we help our clients improve those engines, and our platform helps them deploy those engines at scale. And one of the really cool features of our site is that it enables you to do this yourself. So you don't necessarily have to hire our professional services group and our language consultants to build these engines for you, you can learn how to do this yourself, and you can use the Kanban platform to actually um, do this um, uh, build these engines for you. So who are our clients? Well, our clients come from a huge range of um, industries from a diverse um, sector of different industries. So we, of course, we sell a lot of our technology to localization service providers. These are companies that are set up to provide translation services. And I guess they use the Kanban platform um, to develop you know, high-speed, high-quality machine translation um, systems for their clients, the clients that they sell onto. And their number one goal really is to improve translator productivity, reduce project turnaround time, and obviously reduce their cost of translation. And they share those benefits with their clients and that's a good business for them, and that's a good business for their clients. But we do sell directly to large um, localization companies, uh, sorry, um, engineering companies, and a lot of automotive com companies. So, for instance, we sell a lot to the GM, uh, um, large automotive um, uh, makers such as GM, Ford, and Volvo. We also work with mobile phone companies such as Samsung, some of the day-to-day um, -day well known um, internet companies such as Yahoo and Panda, and then we deal with some very, very large software companies such as Kaspersky, HP, and Seagate. So we've got um, a vast range of clients in a wide, diverse range of industries. So let's talk about the, the economic argument for why our clients use machine translation. What do they use, or how do they go about using it, or why do they go about using it? And I think the first thing that drives them to looking at machine translation as a viable technology to improve uh, translator productivity and save cost and, and effort is the market dynamics. And if you look at the market dynamics today, particularly since the whole world is going online, they're starting to buy things online, they're starting to have lots more applications are coming out online, 
A recent study by the European Union of 2,500 web consumers spread over eight European countries and found that 73% of consumers are more likely to purchase a product if it's in their own language. And that dynamic is driving a huge amount of activity in the market today because e-commerce is probably the fastest and biggest growth area for machine translation today. They are translating their online catalogs so that they can reach international markets. And by using machine translation, they're hoping to get there faster than their competitors. Interesting enough, um, another finding from this particular um, uh, survey was that nine out of 10 internet users um, will visit a website um, in their own language if given a choice. So in other words, the propensity to read about the products and services for, for, um, 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 that they're interested in buying or using is much higher if the actual website's in their language. Okay, so again, that's a market dynamic that's driving the need for faster, higher volume translation. And machine translation plays its part in that, in doing that faster, cheaper, over um, shorter, condensed periods of time. 42% of consumers um, never buy a product um, unless it's in their languages. So if you're interested in having an international strategy and you want to sell your products um, or your services in international markets, you immediately cut it down by half if you don't have that available in that target language. Again, market dynamic that's really driving a lot of com companies to consider translating um, all of their web presences and all of their web portals into those um, target foreign languages as well. Now, the market is also vast. If you look at just the e-commerce market um, today in worldwide, um, in 2013, that market was about 260 billion US dollars. And that's estimated to grow to $450 billion. So more and more people are going to the web and they want to see the products and the services they are buying in their language and they're doing it rapidly. So there's a migration to the web that's almost exponential and it's driving huge opportunities for companies that can really get onto this um, uh, initiative, start translating their content and start working with those clients in their own language. And the international sales component of that, that's just the international market or non-English speaking market, as we refer to it in our company, is worth in excess of 200 billion. So yes, you can have a strategy to have only English product sales and you'll do quite well because it's quite a big market. It's about $250 billion. But guess what? There's another market equally as big, which is worth another $200 billion if you can actually reach those markets, translate your content, and get your catalog content and translate it into those foreign languages. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it, of it is just the sheer content or volume that needs to be translated today. So if you have a translation strategy that's predicated on human endeavor alone, it's probably going to fail at some stage in the near future because you're going to have to automate it. You're going to have to actually add machines and possibly an element of um, machine translation to it in order to rapidly accelerate the translation of that content into your market. So let's have a look at just how big this um, um, market is, just in terms of sheer volume. Well, there's 2,749,000,000 people online today. That's 38% of the world's population. That's a vast, vast number. And if you look at it, 79% of people in the States are online, 42% of people in China are online, 11% of Indian uh, people are online, and 84% just in the UK. So vast amount of populations are going online every year or every day. And the average time spent online per month is approximately 16 hours. Now, if anybody in the audience has any teenage kids, you'll get a sense that teenagers spend their entire life online and they buy everything online. And that's kind of creeping into every aspect and facet of industry um, today. And if you think about it, that is the equivalent of 36 billion hours per month spent online by the world population. It's a phenomenally large number. And if, you're, if you don't have an online presence and you're not speaking the language of your clients, you're going to miss out on that opportunity. And if you look at how, where people spend their time online, 
they spend 20% reading um, and content, 5% of their time buying online, and they use a lot of social channels. So if you want to actually connect with your clients, if you want to actually communicate with your clients and advertise your content and your services, it's a great way of doing it um, if you localize that content as well. In terms of connected devices, if you think about it at the moment, there's about 8.7 billion devices connected to the internet, and that's actually more than the entire world population. It seems incredible that there are more devices connected than we have people on the planet, but that gives you a sense of the sheer scale of what's going on. And of that, there's approximately 1.5 billion smartphones, and um, so obviously mobile advertisements and services available that you can buy on mobile is very important as well. And of course, everything is, is because of that, it's driving massive, massive content. And uh, by the end of this year, we estimate, or certainly um, the Common Sense Advisory Board estimate that there will be about eight zettabytes of data um, out on the internet, um, which is just phenomenal. It's going to quadruple, um, since that's quadrupling of content on the, on the internet since 2013, a really phenomenal amount of content that needs to be translated. Something that I find absolutely amazing is that there's 144 billion emails sent every single day. That just seems incredible, and I think everybody would probably agree that in today's business sense, you could nearly have death by email because you get so many emails in your inbox, but that just gives you a sense of how much content is going around there. And then if you think of um, digital marketing or digital content, there's four, 540 million photographs uploaded every single day. Um, to uh, photograph and um, sharing sites and so on. Again, phenomenal activity, sharing of data and the delivery of that data to your clients um, as well. Um, one of the things that really amazes me is the amount of time um, people spend on the internet um, in terms of purchasing or researching their purchasing decisions. Um, and I think if your content is available and it's translated in those languages, and you can actually make have a dialogue with those clients and reach out to those different markets. And I think those volume issues and the amount of connected devices is driving huge demand um, for language services today. The next thing that's driving um, demand for uh, wider spread use of machine translation is that today it's not that difficult to get a rapid return on your investment because the cost of deploying and training and customizing machine translation has dropped dramatically over the last two to three years. And that's been driven somewhat by the technology that Cantan has developed, because we now have clients building their own engines, training um, the engines using their own data, and doing it in a matter of hours and getting systems up and running in a matter of days, um, whereas the, traditionally, it would take months of effort to actually build a high quality engine. So technology is playing a lot of this because it's automating the customization of engines. So rapid ROI means that all of our clients can actually spend money and invest in MT and typically they'd get a return on their investment within their very, very first projects. Now if you go back two or three years in the industry to make machine translation pay, Typically, you'd be talking two to three years. Now we're talking in your very first project, it's so inexpensive to use machine translation, you can actually have a very positive return. So let me give you an example of a client that actually did this. This is an e-commerce client. This is a, an e-commerce client based in the Nordic countries. In fact, they are the biggest e-commerce client in the Nordic um, 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 countries. And they wanted to sell um, in their neighboring country of Sweden. Now, Norway is right beside Sweden, but Swedish people don't speak Norwegian. So the only way they could sell in the country next door to them was basically to not only translate their website, but because they're an e-commerce website, they had to translate all the catalog content. And that was a huge undertaking. They wanted to launch the week Swedish website in 19 days. They wanted to take one of their product catalogs, which was the beauty product catalog, and they wanted to translate 780,000 words. And they wanted to do this within their current localization process. And one of the biggest challenges um, that they faced was that they didn't really have an awful lot of training data um, to prime the system or to customize the engine. But they had some, but not a huge amount. 
And because we work in the localization industry, of course, this project had to happen instantaneously. You know, we'd love to have six months to plan these projects and devise a strategy to do it, but we don't. Generally speaking, clients have an urgency when they are trying to get into new markets. They want to get in ahead of the competition or they want to get in because of some, maybe it's coming up to the Christmas um, um, uh, selling uh, period and so on. So this project was undertaken by one of our partners, Malengo, who was fully trained on how to build engines on the Cantan platform and they did remarkably well. So they translated the entire website, including the product catalog of um, three quarters of a million words in 17 days, two days ahead of schedule. So Melengo did an absolutely fantastic job. And compared to human translation, the actual savings on this project was 62%. Phenomenal savings because they use machine translation. The translators were operating at approximately 8,000 words per day. Now, to put that into perspective, Generally, a translator would work at around two and a half thousand um, words per day. So, you know, that's a three, three and a half time improve, 350% improvement in time. So their translators, who were mostly in-house translators, were incredibly more productive because the machine had pre-translated everything. The Cantan MT engine had pre-translated everything. And they were so impressed with the money that they saved, they were able to bring on another two languages using the savings and those two languages were delivered in an additional three weeks. So straight away, here we had a client had never used machine translation before, and I have to say, um, were very, very skeptical about whether machine translation could positively impact their project. But in their very first use of the system, which was customized by our partner, Malengo, they saved 62%, and the amount they saved, they immediately reinvested that in additional languages. So it actually drove demand for more localization, which is great. And in fact, one of the handouts today is the case study that talks in more detail about how this client actually got these savings. So three reasons that are driving requirements for machine translation. We have the market dynamics, we have the sheer volume, and then we have rapid ROI. It is now possible with the new systems and new platforms, just like Cantan, to rapidly get a return on your investment. So that's my viewpoint. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Alan, who's going to give a, an alternative viewpoint from a consultant's point of view. And Alan has um, decades of, of experience working with large companies in technical publishing environments, helping them um, not only design content strategies, but helping them also lead these content strategies into the use of machine translation as well. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm going to hand you over now to Alan. Alan, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Tony. Am I coming through clearly? You're loud and clear. I'm going to make you the presenter here now, and okay. perhaps you can make uh, me presenter when you're finished so we can do Q&A at the end of this. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you, Tony. And uh, let me show my screen here. Okay. So signal me if you're not seeing my screen. It should be uh, should be on display. And I hope that uh, what I have to say complements uh, Tony's uh, Tony's discussion. I'm speaking specifically in the technical communication market, and hope to share some some very interesting facts and statistics about uh, machine translation in technical communication. So. I run a company called Group Wellesley Incorporated. We're based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and our mission is to help organizations improve their publishing processes, their pro processes for creating, uh, for authoring, managing, delivering, translating, publishing technical content. And that involves many different solutions. Every Everybody's, uh, everybody's uh, situation and requirements and constraints and budget uh, uh, and goals are are different. I've I've learned that uh, pretty early on as a consultant. So we try to put together appropriate solutions for our clients' business problems um, with within their budget. And I'm very excited by the. Uh, advent of machine translation. Oh, and by the way, a little bit more about myself. Uh, 
some things I'm proudest of, uh, past international president of the Society for Technical Communication. Um, I'm also a former member of the DITA Technical Committee, so my name happens to be on the uh, last two versions of the DITA specification and I'm ARH on Twitter. So I'm, I'm very excited about machine translation as it applies to technical communication because the, the, the technology is in such uh, good alignment with uh, technical communication practices and uh, I'll be uh, drilling down into that more in more detail. Um, the market for translation and interpretation services is, is big and growing. It's growing at, I believe, 20% a year, and so clearly there's more uh, and increasing demand for translation services. More and more companies want to localize their content, their technical content, um, and enter new markets. And as Tony touched on, people want to read content in their native language. And when they engage in transactions, they want to engage in transactions in their native language. So a, a person is far, far more likely to buy your product or service if you provide content in that person's native language. So um, as, as my company's ramped up to provide machine translation services, I, I have an article published in a recent issue of the STC Intercom magazine. That's in the March issue, and we're providing that as a handout to this webinar. So, so what I'm seeing, I, um, I, I, I saw the growth and adoption of, of translation memory as a supporting technology for translators. And even today, I'm a little surprised that occasionally I find uh, organizations that aren't using translation memory. Usually, usually they're giving uh, their content to somebody's brother or sister or uncle for, uh, for translation. Uh, and, and, and that is just exceedingly rare. It's um, the use of and support of translation memory is expected today and it's surprising if you're not using it unless you're working in a niche space like translating poetry or literature, a space where uh, rhyme and nuance and uh, where the translator really has to uh, engage the content at a different level than what you have in most marketing content or e-commerce content or technical communication. So I expect in the very, very near future, machine translation will also be an expected part of every uh, every technical communication, every e-commerce, every marketing workflow, um, just as translation memory is expected today. And why? Lots of reasons. You can. It's it's clear that the uh, adoption, the availability of machine translation technologies is has. Uh, uh, has become widely available. Uh, the the supporting technologies, big data, cloud computing, uh, they've all converged to really make machine translation a uh, affordable and effective solution. I was struck by uh, uh, this magazine article. I subscribed to a magazine called Make. It's uh, focused on uh, do-it-yourself projects, and a recent issue featured a universal translator built on a Raspberry Pi, which is a $35 computer, all using open source. Uh, open source software and components. And it's it's surprisingly effective. Um, this will not give you the performance of uh, Canton MT, but just as, as an example of the, uh, the availability of machine translation technology. I believe Google Translate is uh, up to 500 million monthly users, and they're claiming to do a billion translations a day. So there are all these free services as well. So machine translation is really coming in to the mainstream. So looking at it from uh, you know, my, uh, my perspective, you know, the profession that I value dearly, technical communication, uh, I believe technical communication is uniquely positioned to benefit from this machine translation revolution. And there are a couple of reasons for this. There are certain characteristics of technical communication. Technical communication should be direct. It should be clear. It should be concise. It should be trunk chunked. It should be um, it should use consistent style, consistent terminology. We have um, we have technologies or we have practices like uh, like information typing. 
a task in a technical communication context should should be consistent, should match other tasks in the same documentation set. The 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 format, the, um, the you know the publishing layout should should be consistent across um, you know across a documentation set. And it just so happens that all of these factors contribute to successful machine translation. Just the the order, the predictability of content in a technical in, in 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 most in a technical communication context um, makes makes that type of content um, very well suited for machine translation. And it's it's interesting working in this field. Technical communication. A lot of people aren't aware of this. Uh, in, especially those in related fields, but technical communication has been at the forefront front of process improvement for many, many years. I'm hearing now in marketing uh, conferences, in um, uh, content marketing events, those people are trying to, they're, they're struggling with and they're solving the problems of writing once, publishing to multiple channels, of customizing content on the fly, of filtering content for different audiences, of, of publishing audience-specific, audience-appropriate content. And te in technical, technical communication, we've been doing single source publishing for several decades, from the advent of online help, uh, probably in the 1990s, even the 1980s. So we have solved these issues, single source publishing, the use of plain language, the use of controlled language, uh, the uh, practices of modular content, defining content in chunks, chunks that are easy for humans to scan, easy for humans to read, the idea of information typing, so formalizing the types of content that we present to the user, task, concept, reference, if any of you are familiar with the DITA information architecture. Um, a, a really large uh, practice in technical communication, the separation of content and format. So keeping your content in a markup language like XML and using style sheets to publish in appropriate form to, to appropriate output devices. So you're going to style your HTML content differently than you will style the same content for print. But it's the same authored content just published to different channels. So in technical communication, we have 20 or 30 years of continual process improvement, continual development of best practices. And it's only logical that machine translation is the next step for our profession to embrace. Okay, so uh, you know, as, as I as I work with new technologies, and and actually uh, calling calling machine translation and new technology is a misnomer. Uh, machine translation has been around in the 50s since the 1950s, I believe, but it's just now it's really reached the tipping point in availability, quality, uh, scalability, price. But when I think that something is at the tipping point, I, I'm, I always like external confirmation. So I was working on my STC, uh, my Society for Technical Communication presentation, actually. We just had our, uh, our international conference. And the New York Times uh, newspaper, I believe it's the most uh, widely read Sunday paper in the United States, just behind the Wall Street Journal in daily numbers. My New York Times falls on my doorstep. The magazine features an article about machine translation, and they they talk about some of the tensions between the old style, the uh, the human translators, and the uh, machine translation community. It's very interesting, uh, very interesting read. I also started a novel the other day that started with a machine translation scenario. So that leads me that that provides evidence to me that. This uh, the machine translation is real and is is entering the mainstream. So I think what we're seeing now, as, as Tony said in his portion, any localization workflow that is solely dependent on human beings will fail. Why? Just the efficiencies offered by machine translation are are so appealing that it will no longer be viable, no longer be economical to maintain all human workflows. 
So let's look at the economics of machine translation, specifically for technical communication. And and it's 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 very interesting. Some of the motivations or the the motivations for machine translation that uh, people like me and people like Tony are seeing, it's usually not cost reduction. It's usually efficiency improvement. It's usually increasing the amount of localized content that an organization offers, increasing the speed of providing that content. So cost may be a side benefit. It's, it's certainly a benefit, but it's often not the, it's not the leading, um, you know, it's not the leading driver. Usually it's increasing amount of translated content and increasing the speed of that, of that localization process. So if we take a, a 100,000 word documentation set, you know, a mid-size set of content to support a product or service. If you put that through a human translation workflow at the industry standard 2,500 words per day, that takes 40 days. And that's, that's two months of five-day work weeks. For two months to translate a moderately sized uh, technical uh, documentation set. If you use a hybrid machine translation workflow with human post editing, you're looking at 8,000 words a day. So 12 and a half days to, to translate that documentation set for your product or service and provide that, that, um, pro provide that foothold into a new marketplace a 60% improvement in translation efficiency, going from two months to just over a half a month, less than three weeks, all through machine translation. And the question people like Tony and I always get, what about quality? You know, machine translation versus all human workflows. And it's not hard to find examples of bad machine translation. They're often extracted from the free services like Google Translate. So we see those translations, we, we may scoff at them, we may laugh at them, but they generally do meet the audience's needs. That's why 500 million people a day are using Google Translate, because even these translations that, uh, that uh, yeah, may not be perfect are meeting a human being's needs. So. And we can put that aside as well because um, that's a free service. If you deploy something like Cantem and MT, you're looking at training so that the engine understands your domain, can handle your domain, and you're looking at continual process improvement with that. Now, we, but really the, the machine translation versus all human workflow is sort of an apples to apples comparison. And why? Because you can pick your translation quality based on the workflow you choose. So you can do pure machine translation for some types of content, maybe for social media content, for customer support content, for, for blog content, you know, content that's high volume where, where quality of output is, is maybe less important but you still want localized content to meet your customer needs. And you can use machine translation with human post editing to get the equivalent content that, you, that you've had experienced otherwise. And you're getting that equivalent content, or I'm sorry, equivalent quality with 8,000 words a day throughput instead of 2,500 words a day throughput. So the key is you have a range of options that give you a range of quality, range of, of cost, range of speed. So you actually have more flexibility with a machine translation workflow to uh, dial those, those metrics in appropriately. Pick your cost, pick your quality, pick your speed. And in all cases, the, the economics is much more appealing than that of a all human workflow. Okay, and because of because of the appeal, the the just unquestionable economic appeal of machine translation, I th I think it's fair to say if you don't use machine translation, your customers will certainly your competitors will as well. So I've I've seen some interesting articles um, about 
customer machine translation. And there was one in uh, TC World magazine. It's a uh, publication of TCOM, a German-based technical communication organization. And TC World is talking about protecting against rogue MT. And as I read this, I, I was uh, struck a little bit. What is, what is Rogue MT? Well, Rogue MT is your customers translating your content for you. So, the idea, and and that means that your control over the content, your your control over your brand, is is lost. It's out of your hands. So essentially, the message is: if you don't translate your content, your customers will, and they will uh, they may do so inappropriately. So if you want to maintain control over your localization processes, you should do that yourself. Okay, and wrapping up, I think in, in conclusion, the, the effects of machine translation in the technical communication space and in the, in the general localization space, I think it's unquestionable. The effects are you can translate more content, you can do so faster, and you can do so more cheaply, more inexpensively. And I think it's appropriate to ask yourself, are you on board? If you're not using machine translation, uh, why aren't you doing so currently? And when do you intend to look at that? So that wraps up my portion of the presentation. And my contact information will be on the slides that, uh, that will be provided after the webinar. So thank you very much. And I'm going to put it back to Tony. Alan, thank you very much for that. Um, I'll just take back its presenter here. Thank you very much. And uh, I actually have a quick question for you, Alan, okay. um, because it's a question that's always jumped into my mind um, when you're building technical publishing content, like tech book. What's the effort involved in making sure that it's, or what's the overhead um, due to the effort to make sure that it's machine translatable or better or easy for a machine to translate. Is this five, ten percent or is it like a whole huge amount of extra work? Do you have a sense that you can share with us on that? Yes. Well I I think um, good technical communication practices indicate machine translation. And there are a number of ways or are are um, conducive to good machine translation uh, results. And good technical communication practices are, have been in place long before machine translation. They actually help human translation workflows. So things like uh, keeping your sentences short, 25 words or less. You know, that's that's a well-known metric. Um, you know, below that, human localiz localizers have an easier uh, time, um, and machine translation tends to be more effective. Uh, active voice. You know, one of the oldest uh, one of the oldest tips in in technical communication. The thing that you learn in in your first uh, writing class in in grade school mm -hmm. is is you know also an effective uh, increases the effectiveness of machine translation. But it also increases your customers' understanding of your content. Excellent. So I I guess my um, what I'm getting at is. Uh, the effort to improve your content for machine translation um, has has always improved your content for other purposes, uh, specifically uh, you know your the ability of your customer to understand that content. Gotcha. And there are a number of different ways to enforce that. Um, some are uh, more economical than others. There are style guidelines. There are peer reviews. There are human editors. There are automated systems that check for sentence length and um, consistency in language and terminology. So there's really a range uh, and it depends on how well trained your content contributors are now and uh, you know how 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 well they create uh, good quality content um, and how much support they need to do that to, to ensure that they're doing that. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. So I guess if, if you've got good, st structured, um, organized processes for creating your content today based on best practices, it's an incremental step to introduce a machine translation component to your localization process because you've already got that, those good practices instilled are already embedded in uh, the development of your content. 
and that's uh, great to know. Now, I'd like everybody to just to draw your attention to the fact that there are handouts um, to this presentation. We've got five handouts for everybody here, and there's an article written uh, by Alan um, in relation to machine translation, which is a must-read in my mind. Um, I read it when I was at the SEC conference there a couple of weeks ago, and it's a really, really good read. Um, on machine translation, and then there's a couple of um, case examples of how other clients have used uh, machine translation to great success. Now, um, Louise, you have a number of questions from your side, so perhaps you can um, ask a few of them. I think we have about five minutes left. Um, so I do. Maybe you can prioritize the, hopefully, the easy ones first, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well then, um, let's see, because I actually do have quite a few questions here, but uh, thank you both for your brilliant presentations. Uh, let's just see if I can kind of start off with a, with a simple enough one. So here's one now that maybe I'll direct it Alan, to Alan first, and then maybe Tony, you could end the thought on. If I'm new to localization, how should I choose what languages to start with? Okay, well, that, that's a good question, Louise. Um, in technical communication, technical communication is often constrained by uh, local laws and regulations. So if you're selling into Canada, you need to provide an English and, and French translation of, of your technical content. So that's very, very clear. If your target market has a, a requirement to translate into a particular language, then you have to provide that language, but in the in the absence of, of um, such constraints, if you're sort of uh, trying to blue sky your entry into the global market, um, and, and maybe Tony can speak to this a little bit better than I can, but there are a, a small number of languages, a relatively small number of languages that will give you very good coverage of the global market. In other words, if you translate to these languages, um, you will have native most of the world is is uh, conversant in in those languages. So, Tony, do you want to elaborate on that at all? Sure, sure. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, we c categorize languages um, as category A, B, C, and D languages. And uh, category A languages are the easiest ones to machine translate, and obviously, um, and get good results quickly. And then category D are the most complex and take a lot more work. So what is a category A mar uh, language? Well, a category A language generally is languages that are based on the uh, Romance or what we would call the Roman alphabet, uh, and we would refer to them in Europe as the Romance languages. Uh, category B languages then would be the Germanic or Nordic languages, because they tend to have much more complex word, noun, adjective formats. They don't generally have compound nouns, um, and um, the actual structure of the sentences tend to vary dramatically across language boundaries. Category C languages then would be languages such as Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, the um, Asian languages, I guess. I should say, by the way, that some of the um, Cyrillic languages would be category A and B languages, depending on the actual um, uh, country that you're dealing with. And then category D languages would be languages that come from the Middle East and they're bi-directional type languages. And I always throw in Vietnamese and Thai into category D because we've got not only um, single by characters there, but we have zero, sorry, single by characters, but we also have zero by characters in those languages as well. So that's the way we would look at them. And most of our clients, believe it or not, would tend to pick the Romance languages to start their machine translation with and the reason they do that is because it gets them into the game of introducing machine translation into their workflow and they can pretty much guarantee positive ROI at a very rapid uh, pace and that's what they like to see because it's a new technology it's a new strategy for them and they want to see success clocked up as quickly as possible so that's typically how we see clients um, actually do that Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. They're both very good answers. Um, I'm just going to move on to another question that we received. Uh, do you, I think this is probably directed for Tony. Do you use the machine translations and learnings from engines uh, you build for a client and then provide that provides a large MT for another client? So I suppose do you build the engines and then transfer that data to another client? 
Sure. Um, no. And the reason we do that is because of our security policy. When our clients upload data to their Camtan account, it's completely encrypted for their use and their use only. And we will never repurpose, retask, or republish that content in any other format. And that's very important for some of our clients who are some of the largest companies in the world that they know that when they put their data um, on into their Cantan um, account, that it's completely um, secure. Okay. Now, having said that, we do have approximately five billion words of stock training data that we have cleansed from publicly available sources. It's available to all of our clients free of charge as part of and to help them build engines using a combination of our training data and a combination or a blend of their training data as well. And if you go onto our website, we also tell you where we've taken that data from. We tell you who has published it, what license it's published under. So we give you a provident statement to make sure that you are comfortable in reusing that data should you decide to use it um, in your engines. But it's very important for our clients and it's one of our guarantees that if you upload any data to our server, you and only you can access it. It's never shared with anybody else. Brilliant. Thank you, Tony. Now, I know we're running out of time, but I'm just going to ask this uh, last question. Um, so, again, this is more than like mostly directed to Tony. We have an in-house localization team and are using our own implementation of ROSES. How easy is it to get started with your solution? And what are the main benefits of using Canton T instead of building our own system? Okay, um, it's, it's a very good question actually, and it has come up with some of our clients that they've um, built an MT team, and they've downloaded, I guess, the Moses SDK, maybe version 0.9 or version 1 of Moses, and you know we don't compete with those guys. What we our platform helps them do is build more engines of a higher quality faster. So our platform allows you to build. Um, much better engines okay and the reason it allows you to do that is because we've built lots of technologies that you can use or you can introduce your own technologies and um, by using various pre-processors and data cleansers and tokenizers and things like that so you can get the same capability um, that you would be able to enjoy using the Moses and um, SDK at the command line but you would be able to do it much much quicker and much much faster and at a higher level of quality and um, using the Canton um, platform. So we have clients that have actually migrated from using their own Moses installation to our platform because they require engines with their training data to operate at vastly faster speeds than Moses can deliver. So if you want to do you know, 50 to 100 million words per day on um, an engine, that's not going to happen using the standard version of Moses. Um, but using the Cantan platform and the Cantan autoscale technology and so on, you can deploy engines at that level of scale and get that huge level of throughput as well. So it's very complementary, but the platform helps you be more productive as an engine developer because it's so visual and so easy to actually use. Brilliant, thank you. Now we are unfortunately out of time and we do have quite a few more questions, but what we'll do is we will publish the answers to the questions on a blog, um, on, our, on our company blog and share that with you at a later time. Um, but I'd like to just say that we are going to wrap up now and thank you to both Alan and Tony for excellent presentations. And as we mentioned at the start of the webinar, these, uh, the recording and the slide deck will be available to you all next week. You will receive an email with them. And if you have any suggestions for future webinar topics or would like to know more about Canton MT, please drop us an email to info at Okay, uh, thank you very much.